Good afternoon and welcome to Downing Street for today's coronavirus briefing. We're going to do things slightly differently today and I'm going to go through the charts. Uh, I'm joined by Professor John Newton from the Test and Trace programme uh, and we'll then answer questions from the public and from journalists. And if there's one message that we have today, it's that it is incredibly important for anybody who has symptoms of coronavirus, a cough or a fever or a change in your sense of taste or smell, that you get a test. Because it's by people coming forward to get the test, which you can get on nhs.uk forward slash coronavirus, or by dialing 119. It's by getting those tests that we're able to identify those who've got the virus, ensuring that you get the best possible treatment and ensuring that we can then trace the virus and that we can, through that, we can control the virus. So that is the most important message and what everybody can do to help to control this virus. If we turn now to the slides, the first slide shows testing capacity and new cases. And yesterday, there were 128,437 tests in the UK, meaning that there's been a total of 4.48 million tests that have been carried out since the start of this crisis. Now, of course, testing capacity stands at a higher level. Testing capacity stands at 206,000. 444. And this shows that there is extra capacity for more tests, and tests are available right now on the website if you go to nhs.uk forward slash coronavirus, or if you can't access the web, if you dial 119. And I wanted to highlight that because it's so important that people come forward for a test, and anyone who needs a test can get a test. The next if we say at the previous slide, the next chart shows that there are 1,570 cases confirmed as of yesterday. And this is the lowest number since the 25th of March. In total, 276,000 people, um, cases have been confirmed in total. But this number of 1,570 uh, is, uh, it, it shows that we've seen continued downward progress in the number of new confirmed cases. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. We're getting this virus under control, and this is why we can make the cautious, small, positive steps that we've been able to make today. Now, if we look at the number of admissions with COVID-19 to hospital at 479, that's down from a peak of 3,121 on the 2nd of April. And the number of the proportion of people on uh, mechanical ventilators, uh, the number that corresponds to that 9% figure is that there are 606 people on mechanical ventilators. Again, that is the lowest since late March. Next slide, please. The picture is repeated across the country where we've seen in almost every case the number of people in hospital with COVID-19 is the lowest since late March. And as of yesterday, there were 7,541 people in hospital with COVID-19. If we go to our final slide, sadly, 39,045 people have died with coronavirus, confirmed with a positive test. That's 111 yesterday, again, that figure is the lowest figure since lockdown began on the 23rd of March. So we can see from these charts the pattern right across the board, which is that on the substance, we're making significant progress, but there is still more to be done. And I just want to say a few notes of thanks. Thanks to our volunteers responders, who in their hundreds of thousands have come forward and stepped up to the plate. Thanks to the charities and the charity groups who are working so hard in very difficult times. 
Thanks, colleagues in the NHS and in social care. And also to the businesses, the pharmaceutical companies and the diagnostics companies, without whom we simply couldn't have mounted this response. To the pharmacists and the dentists, and I'm very pleased that dentistry is going to uh, restart from next week. And especially for their hard work and their understanding, all of the families who stand behind those who are on the front line. And at the start of Pride season, I want to take a moment when we can't get together as we normally would to thank all colleagues in the LGBT community who do so much in the NHS and across social care. I think these data show that the action plan is working. The data show that we're winning the battle against coronavirus. Today, we're therefore able to make some cautious changes to the lockdown rules carefully and safely. Of course, these are balanced judgments and we take these decisions very carefully. We must all remember that in the war against this virus, we are all on the same side. We've come so far together, we can take these steps together, but do not step too far. The disease is not done yet. We mustn't throw away the progress that has been made. So please take your responsibilities seriously. If you have symptoms, you must get a test. And if the NHS asks you to isolate, you must do so. And to everybody, please stay alert, control the virus and save lives. We'll now go straight to questions. The first question uh, from, the first questions are from the public and the first question is from Nick from London on video. Nick. With the coronavirus sending us into a deep recession that's likely to hurt the prospects of many school leavers and young people, what is the government planning to do to address this? Well, thanks, Nick. That's a, a very, very important question. As well as the health response, we take very seriously the economic response, especially towards those who are starting out in their careers. As you have mentioned, school leavers and young people, but actually right across the board. The amount of economic support that we've put into the economy is unprecedented. With the furlough scheme, one of the most generous in the world, and the direct support for businesses, because our judgment is that it's best to keep businesses up and running as much as is possible. We can't save everyone, but keep them up and running as much as possible, therefore to keep the jobs there for people to go back to as we get through this crisis. But it's also true that the economy is going to have to change. We're going to have to need a different type of economy as we come out of this. And you'll be hearing more of that from the Chancellor and the Prime Minister, who have been working so hard on getting this right uh, in, the, uh, in the weeks and months to come. It's an incredibly important question. We want to support the economy. We've put that financial support in, but we've got to make sure that the opportunities are there as well. Unless you've got anything to add. Thank Add on that one. We'll go to Jill from Warrington. Jill asks, the shielding advice was updated on the 29th of May. It did not indicate it was safe for those who are clinically extremely vulnerable to go outside. What changed on the 30th of May to make it safe? Well, thank you, Jill. We understand just how significant asking people to shield was and still is because the shielding is still very important. And if you think about the impact of having to stay at home for 10 weeks so far and to have to take the extraordinary measures that we've put in place to shield the clinically extremely vulnerable, that has been a very major step. And so when the clinical advice said that it was safe to be able to advise those who are shielded to be able to go outside so long as they stay two metres away from others, then I think that is a, it's a small step. It's a very positive step for those who have been shielding. And I know that it's been very well received by those who are shielding, and therefore can just start uh, to make that positive change and just to be able to go outside, staying two metres away uh, from others. So I'm glad we were able to make that change. We announced it when it was uh, when it was safe and ready to do so. And as I think uh, you can see from the charts that we put up, 
one of the reasons that we could make that change is that the rate of incidence of disease is now back down to the levels that it was before we introduced the shielding policy. Um, but of course, the mainstay of the shielding policy, which is not to meet other people, uh, it remains in place and is very important. It's just that people can, uh, we think it's safe for people to go outside in a very cautious and careful way. John? Um, well, just so to say, as you say, just to emphasize the, the main consideration is the rate of infection in the community at the time. And as you've shown on the slides, all the indications are that that is decreasing, albeit slowly. And in fact, there are other surveillance data. So Public Health England publishes its weekly surveillance reports with a whole range of other sources uh, which are available on the web. Uh, and they also show uh, reductions in the rate of infection. Although I think very important that there are differences in different parts of the country uh, and those uh, rates are kept under review. So all these decisions are, are kept under review. Thank you. Thanks very much, and thanks very much for your question, Jill. I think it's a very, very important subject. Um, we now turn to Hugh Pym from the BBC. Thank you very much, Secretary of State. You've said that test and trace is vital to stopping the spread of the virus. We've heard reports from some contact tracers that since they started work in England last Thursday, they've had very little if anything, to do. What do you think is actually happening with the system? Uh, thanks, Hugh. Uh, I'll, I'll say something, and then I'll ask uh, John uh, to, uh, to add to that. The system is up and running. Uh, it's successful. I'm very glad to report that those who are asked to isolate by the contact tracers are expressing the, uh, the willingness to do so, and we track that uh, very uh, carefully. Now, one of the good the pieces of good news is that, that as the rate of incidence of new cases comes down, so of course there are fewer index cases to track. Um, and we've hired, as you know, 25,000 uh, people to work as contact tracers. Um, and the level of incidence of disease has come down. And so, so actually we, we have more capacity than we need. This is a, this is a good thing. Yes, thank you, Secretary of State. Um, so, the, yeah, so exactly, the, the test and trace program is working well. The data are flowing from the testing uh, portal into the contact tracing uh, software, which is all have been built relatively new. So we're very pleased to see that all working well, and the contacts are being identified. Um, there are different levels. There's the clinical public health level, which looks at more complicated cases, for example, those arising in care homes or in, in outbreaks of, of, of some sort. And then there are cases which, where people can, in fact, enter their own contact details on the web-based portal. So that doesn't require uh, the intervention of one of the uh, call handlers, the, the contact tracers. And then there are those who need to be contacted by the contact tracers. And there are plenty of uh, cases and contacts being reported and being pursued in all three of those areas. So they are all working and they're all working well. Uh, but as Secretary of State says, we, we do have a lot of capacity. We're very grateful for all those people who have come forward to work as contact tracers. Uh, and uh, at the moment, uh, many of them uh, are not fully occupied, but we wait and see. Uh, one of the challenges, of course, of this is to build a system that can respond to whatever comes in the future. Uh, and that is a little difficult to predict. We think there will be flare-ups in different parts of the country and we'll need to be able to divert resources as required. But we, we wait and see. But at the moment, um, it is working... It's working well. Thanks very much. Can I ask a follow-up? Yes, of course. Do you know how many contacts have actually been made since Thursday? Because with nearly 2,000 new cases each day, you'd have thought there would have been quite a lot of work for them to do, even with the factors you've mentioned. Well, well if you think about it, um, today, the figures I announced today uh, are that there were only 1,570 uh, new cases, which is lower than when we were planning this system. Uh, and so I think to err on the side of having too many contact tracers is the right side to err on. Uh, and I'd rather have uh, too many people trained and ready to go. We've got 7,500 clinicians in the system, uh, which means that for every new case, uh, we have um, uh, on average six clinicians able to support them. Um, and that also one of the interesting things is that the number of contacts that each index case has is a bit lower than we were expecting. 
um, which implies that people are following the uh, social distancing rules and are not coming into contact with uh, large numbers of people. But of course, that also reduces the demand on, on the contact trace. Thanks very much, Hugh. The next question from Tom Clark at ITV. Tom. Um, thanks very much, Secretary of State. Uh, can I just follow up on Hugh's question, actually? Around 9,000 people have tested positive for COVID-19 since Test and Trace was launched last week. How many have been contacted by Contact Tracer and how many of their contacts have been traced? So I don't have those figures. Uh, I'll, I'll ask uh, John to answer, but the, the answer is the vast majority. And of course, many of them are able to put the, uh, the details in on a web-based portal rather than directly on the phone. Well, the, the figures are going to be available soon, but as Secretary of State says, the numbers of, uh, tests, being, uh, of tests feeding through and contacts being identified are high, and so we're, we're very pleased with the level of completeness. Um, so it's operating really pretty much as we had hoped. Um, of course, of the numbers of new cases, not all of them uh, need to go into the contact tracing process. So if it's a case in a care home uh, of somebody who's already part of a known outbreak or if the case indeed is already known uh, to the public health service then they don't need to be contact traced but of those who are being contact traced a very high proportion of people are uh, working with us to use the use the uh, web-based system themselves or to uh, provide us with the information so we're really very pleased and the numbers are uh, as we know we, we did a trial in the Isle of Wight um, where we uh, we had some expectations from that and, and Secretary said so you said um, the numbers of contacts are less than we had expected. That was, that's really less than what the modelers had in their models on which they were using to, to base the effectiveness. They're actually quite similar to the numbers that we were expecting from the Isle of Wight, because in, in lockdown, of course, people do not have that many close contacts outside their household. So, so the, 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 the system is working well, and we will be publishing some figures soon. I know, I know everyone's very keen to see them. Thanks very much, Tom. May I, may I have a follow-up as well? If okay. I may, just yeah, go ahead, Tom, no problem. Yeah. Uh, as, you, as you yourself said, surveillance of new outbreaks is essential and part yeah. of the test yeah. and trace system and the ability for local lockdowns. As I understand it, that was the job of the Joint Biosecurity Centre. Does that centre exist yet? It's published no reports as far, I can, as far as I can see and has no website. I just wondered if you could update us on the Joint Biosecurity Centre. Uh, yes, uh, that is. we're getting it at, stood up, making sure that the, the, all of the information flows are, uh, 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 it, uh, come to it so it's able to analyse them um, and to make sure that it gets uh, set up uh, correctly. That's all, all that work's being done, um, being done at, as we speak. I'm, but it doesn't exist yet. Well, it, 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 it's being formulated at the moment. It's being pulled together, yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, Sam Coates from Sky. The R if, Secretary of State, if the R rate goes up or the seven-day rolling average for in infections start to plateau or go up, how likely is it that you would reimpose some of the blanket lockdown measures? Because some people think that you just won't do that under almost any circumstances. Um, and John Newton, um, it's quite clear that you have a lot of data on the contact tracing uh, uh, system that you're choosing not to release today. Can I ask, will we get, by the end of this week, data on how many, what proportion of people with infections have been contacted by uh, your army of contact tracers? You know, there have been 3,500 people infected in the last two days. Uh, what proportion of them uh, have been contacted by your contact tracers? Will you reveal how many contacts have been traced for each infected individual, the average number? You say you're tracking that closely, but not giving us a figure again today. And then levels of compliance, how many of those that you phone up agree to isolate? Again, you say, Matt Hancock says, uh, that uh, there, lots of people have expressed a willingness to do that. Will we get each of those transparently released? And why can't we have them now? Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Sam. Um, on the point about the blanket measures, you know, the the truth is we are attempting to move the system from these national blanket measures to a more targeted approach. This is why test and trace is such an important uh, part of that. But we've always said, we've always said that we're prepared to reintroduce measures, whether that's nationally or in response to a localized outbreak, if that is necessary. 
you know, the steps that we're able to take today are cautious steps. Um, they they make they re remove some of the most difficult parts of the lockdown with the goal, of course, of keeping R below one and um, as one of the five tests that we uh, we wanted to meet. I've also been able to change the basis in law of these uh, uh, of, of the lockdown because for the lockdown until uh, today, the law has been that you can't leave your home except for reasons that are specifically set out. And this is very unusual in English law, not uh, the approach that we've traditionally taken for hundreds of years. And instead, we've been able to flip the, um, the basis of the law back to specifically outlining things that you cannot do, um, as opposed to saying you can't do anything unless it's specifically provided for. Um, and I'm very glad we've been able to change the basis of the law to a, and get away from what it was essentially the most author authoritarian part of the system, whilst, of course, having rules and guidance that have made some minor adjustments that people are, um, I, you know, I can see today people are, are, um, are able to do a bit more than they were. And we've seen people going back to school and... Um, uh, uh, and some of the small changes that we've made. But I would just emphasize that they are cautious, they're small, and it's really important that we, we, we stick with it and we keep our resolve as a nation, because it's how we behave that affects the R, um, not, not the rules themselves. Uh, and on the second question, um, John. Yes, so thank you, Secretary. Um, so, yes, very good. I mean, the, uh, they are new systems. They're quite complicated. There are a number of different systems that have been stood up to deliver this. So in order to calculate the figures that you're asking for, you need to draw those data together and integrate them. And we know how important these numbers are and how much uh, attention they get. So we're very keen that when we do report them, they are correct and they're accurate. Uh, and and it is, uh, it's difficult to do that reliably. So uh, I'm sorry if you could bear with us, we are still making sure that we get the, the reliable data. What we don't want to do is to produce some data and then have to go back and correct it. So. Um, so we, we will be producing it. We are monitoring them, um, but we would like to do a little bit more work on the systems before we publish them. Thanks very much, Sam. Peter Thanks. Walker from The Guardian. Thanks. Hi. Um, to both of you, if I could ask the same question, to follow up slightly on what Sam said, uh, Dominic Raab also raised it yesterday, the idea that if in certain parts of the country the infection rate goes up, the idea of a lockdown will be a localised one. Can I ask in practice, how would that actually work? Yes. I mean, would it just be, for example, schools closing, or would there be a kind of stricter rules? Or would it even be like a kind of North Italy or Chinese style one where there'd be restrictions on transport? And can I ask, you know, how would that work? Because people could expect, given the very different infection rates in different parts of the country, that that could actually come to pass. Yes, taking local action to respond to a local flare-up is an incredibly important part of the toolkit that we have available to respond if we need to. Um, and this can take a range of options. For instance, um, shutting to new admissions a hospital A&E if there were an outbreak in that hospital. Um, that's one example. Um, at a local level, the local director of public health has a statutory duty and responsibility and they would work with the regional Public Health England and NHS uh, teams to make sure that we got the response right. The Joint Biosecurity Centre's role is a national one uh, to provide the advice and the information that would then be acted on locally. And the, so it, it, the way to think of it is that is the Joint Biosecurity Centre has the information. It advises the CMOs of the UK who in turn give advice to ministers and to local um, public health bodies through uh, PHE. So that architecture um, is, um, is, is now established. Um, the JBC um, still formally needs to come into uh, existence, but we are putting in place all of those data flows to augment the already significant work that Public Health England do in this space and the toolkit that's available, i.e. the things that we could do, which includes, for instance, changes to the hospitals that I mentioned, um, it, it, that toolkit is as broad as the legal toolkit that we have uh, nationally um, and that's uh, set out in the 1984 uh, Public Health Act for England and Wales um, and in the relevant Scottish and Northern Irish 
uh, legislation augmented by the Coronavirus Act 2020 that we passed a couple of months ago. John. Um, well, yes, thank you, Secretary of State. So, and just to add that this is um, outbreak control uh, in different areas is, is likely to be used. Um, this is what we see in other countries as well, that the coronavirus flares up in, in certain areas. So, as Secretary of State has described, there's a range of public health measures. I mean, the only thing I would add is that it's really a whole system response. So, each area has, as well as the Director of Public Health working for the local authority, there is a local resilience forum where all the other public services, fire service, police and so on, also contribute and, and look at measures that might be taken. Um, it's likely that the outbreaks will occur in certain areas, and therefore one of the uh, things which will be required is what we call in emergency front mutual aid. So where an area has, for example, has to close a certain unit, maybe it's an element of healthcare or, or social care, other areas um, can come in to help them. So there are a number of things that need to be done if you have a local flare-up, some public health, some more to do with a system response. But if this is really an extension of normal processes, but with a very different flavour because of the coronavirus. Thanks very much. Can we have Jamie Kafash from Pulse magazine? Hi. Hello, Secretary of State. Um, you said earlier that the change in shielding advice was well received. Um, however, GPs have told us that today in surgery they've been inundated with patients who are anxious and don't understand why the advice has changed so quickly. Announced on Saturday night, implemented on Monday morning. So why has this been rushed through before patients and GPs who are reliant for advice could actually understand it? Uh, thank you. Well, it, it hasn't been um, rushed through. Far from it. We've um, we've worked for some time um, to make sure that any changes that we make, and these are small, cautious changes, um, can benefit people but in a safe way. Uh, and so, as you say, we announced it at the weekend. Um, and I think that being able to make changes like this um, are, is important for people. Um, it's important for, um, especially for those who are shielded. You know, I, I, I think... It's quite hard to imagine for those of us, even those of us who are practicing um, uh, self-isolation, but have throughout been able to go out, for instance, to exercise, to understand the impact of shielding, of, being, of having by the guidance to stay in your own home. So absolutely, once we made the decision, you, including and in collaboration with all of the uh, government bodies, we then communicated that decision um, and it, this was the right time to be able to change that, um, to be able to change that advice. Um, the final question from Fiona Reid at uh, Dumfrieshire Newspapers. Fiona. Good evening, Secretary of State. Um, thousands of our readers need to travel from Scotland into England every day for work, business, educational reasons. Those people now face mixed messages uh, as lockdown eases on both sides of the border in different ways. So is it time to synchronise the easing of lockdown and have more UK-wide messaging, including just one test and trace system for the whole country? Well, we've worked very closely and very hard to try to ensure that the changes are made on a UK-wide basis. After all, we face this virus as one country. And I think to the very large extent, uh, that is what has happened. Uh, there are some minor differences, but the major principles of the changes and the lockdown rules are the same. I speak to my um, counterpart in the Scottish government regularly. Um, and it is, there is also, in turn, guidance for what people should do at the border. For instance, those in England should not drive to Scotland for recreation. So there's some specifics around the border. Now, legally, of course, the powers to be able to implement the lockdown are devolved. And so I respect the uh, Scottish government's um, uh, uh, right to take slightly different, well, to take different decisions should they want to. And they've made, in some cases, some slightly different decisions. Um, and it is a, therefore, you know, it's a consequence of devolution. But the overall responsibility for public health emergencies is of course a UK wide one and uh, we'll make sure that we do move as closely as possible um, given the different situations on the ground and the different slightly different shape of the pandemic in Scotland. As well please. Yes of course. And maybe Professor Newton. 
Um, so the scientific advice, obviously, as the Secretary of State said, is different in different parts of the UK. Um, so today, shielded people in Scotland still cannot go out, um, unlike in England. So who is right? Um, and are the Scottish and English teams uh, working together, the scientific teams yes. working together or working independently? Yes, yes. Um, so you're quite right to point out, of course, that uh, the same evidence applies across the UK. We do work together. We, we have regular discussions and people, there is cross membership of the different, uh, the different advisory teams. We, we give very similar advice and we do try whenever possible to make the guidance uh, the same or at least to have the same principles behind it. So, so every effort is made by scientific and clinical advisors to recognise what you say, that the public need clear advice and we need to make it the same across the UK. But as Secretary State has pointed out, the mechanisms for implementing that advice are different. Some of that is just the fact that we have different arrangements. So there are different organisations in different parts of the country. So for example, the test and trace programme is implemented slightly differently in Scotland. So you've got slightly different bodies taking a different approach. And sometimes, of course, these are political decisions and these and some of those are devolved. So we, we do everything we can to, uh, to simplify and unify. Uh, and over time, the differences tend to get ironed out. But I fully accept your point. Thanks very much indeed. So that concludes our press briefing for today. See you again soon, Nadab.